few housekeeping um, items. One is that if everybody can mute your microphone, if you're not already, people coming in are probably already muted, but just in case you're not, um, that'll help everybody to have better sound quality. Um, also, feel free to turn off your camera if you want to. Um, you won't need it on, and it'll probably be a little less distracting not to have um, cameras on while we're together this evening. If you're on a laptop or a desktop computer, for the best viewing, you can change your screen settings to Spotlight. You can do this by clicking the three dots in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and choosing um, Layout, Change Layout, and then uh, choosing the Spotlight setting. I'm sorry, I'm just having technical difficulties left and right. Um, okay. Um, so that will allow you to be focused on the speaker. Um, we will be recording this evening's presentation and making it available for later viewing on our website. We have a collection of the ones that we've had so far. Um, so please keep that in mind. Um, therefore, when we have our question and answer period, um, you have an opportunity to submit your question in chat and I can ask the questions and that keeps people from popping in and out of the screen on the recording. Um, after his presentation, Moses will engage with questions. Um, we have three different ways to submit questions. So all of you had an opportunity when you were registering for tonight's session to submit questions and actually many people did. So there's lots of questions that are already posed. Some of them I believe Moses will be addressing in his um, talk and others he will be addressing afterwards. Um, you can also submit your questions during Moses' talk or right after using the chat box. And again, I'll be monitoring that and trying to pose those questions. Um, or if you have a question that you'd, you'd rather ask more privately because your name does show up in the chat box with it, um, you could email me and I will be um, trying to, actually, you know what? I'm gonna tell you to email Tammy because I'm, like I said, I'm kind of on my phone. Um, so it's gonna be hard to check email. So you can email Tammy Willett, which is T-A-M-M-Y dot Willett, W-I-L-L, et at adoptionnetwork.org and she will put that in the chat box so that you've got her email in case you want to submit a question that way. Um, we hope that the series will provide opportunities for community and exploration and comfort during this time. It's designed to nurture our spirits during this time that we're uh, many of us are staying at home and all of the speakers in the series are generously volunteering their time um, and as I said we're posting the recordings. So thank you everybody for participating. Um, so far in the series, we've had Sharon Rosia, April Dinwiddie, Leslie Johnson, Kate Vogel, and Dr. Jennifer King. And um, we are excited as we continue our second month of um, topics tonight. Of course, we have Moses Farrow um, talking about exploring racism and how to prevent it. Um, next week, we have Leslie Pate McKinnon with her talk uh, entitled, Welcome to the House of Mirrors, The Importance of Preparing for a Reunion. And then um, at the end of May on the 25th, we have filmmaker David Bynum viewing and discussing his documentary, A Place of Love. Um, that particular um, session will not be recorded because we will be showing the film and then having discussion. And it will also be 90 minutes long instead of our typical hour so that we have time to um, both show the film and have discussion. Um, okay, uh, so if you have any questions, you can see details and register for those on our website. Um, now I've got the pleasure of introducing Moses Farrow, presenting this evening about exploring racism and preventing racism. Um, Moses has led a private life as a marriage and family therapist in Connecticut. However, in recent years, he has also become um, more outspoken about his childhood and advocating for mental health, child abuse prevention and adoption reform. As a transracial adoptee from Korea being raised in a family of 14, 10 of whom were adopted from countries across the world, Moses draws from his unique perspective to empower adoptees to speak their truth. He believes that we won't fully understand the impacts of adoption unless we all raise our voices. Along his journey, he's contributed in, in numerous ways to the mental health, the field of mental health and the field of adoption. And in 2018, he wrote a personal blog that garnered global attention. As I've come to know Moses in organizing this evening, I have um, come to know that he's involved in a lot of different projects. Um, a couple of those currently include 
working with Valerie Chow in her campaign, Be Cool to Asians, developing a therapist directory to offer free mental health services to frontline and essential healthcare workers and to victims of racism and hate crimes. Um, he's also involved right now in working with Derek Fisher and Jody Gill, who are developing a, a Korean adoptee birth family reunion guide. So with that, I give you to Moses. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Moses Farrow. I'm a marriage and family therapist, a transracial adoptee, and uh, a, a Korean American, uh, excuse me, sorry, uh, a Korean American immigrant. Uh, I'd like to say a quick thanks to Betsy for inviting me to be a speaker in this series. Uh, I'm honored to be among my esteemed colleagues in this space. Um, so I want to wish Happy Mental Health Awareness Month and uh, Asian Pacific Islander American Heritage Month. Uh, did you know that uh, Mental Health Awareness Month began in the U.S. in 1949 by the National Association for Mental Health? Uh, addressing mental health as a country is still relatively new, yet we have made tremendous advances in our study and practice of mental health. The purpose of this month is to raise awareness and educate the public about mental illnesses, the realities of living with these conditions and strategies for attaining mental health and wellness. It's also about suicide prevention and reducing the stigma, which helps people access services. There's a study from 2013 that revealed reported suicide attempts were four times higher among adoptees than non-adoptees. Furthermore, compared with international rates per 100,000 people, the US is at 13.7, South Korea is at 20.2, Korean American adoptees at a, an alarming rate of 54.8. We have been in a mental health crisis and we must continue our efforts to save these lives. The more we can bridge the gap between the mental, the mental, emotional, and physical aspects of our health, the more we will be able to live fully integrated lives. Grow Beyond Words provides a national directory of therapists who are adoptees. There's almost 100 therapists on that list. If you think you need help, visit growbeyondwords.com. It's so wonderful that we celebrate Asian Pacific Islander American Heritage Month. Uh, do you know when the first Asian immigrant came to the US and from where? They came from Japan on May 7th, 1843. It took 135 years before a U.S. president would give the first proclamation to recognize the contributions and influence of Asian Americans. It would take another 31 years to include Pacific Islanders in these presidential proclamations. That's three more generations. So before we get into the topic, let's take a deep breath together. Let's breathe in life and breathe out the toxins you may have right now. Now, let's get into the topic of racism. Not easy to talk about, but virtually impossible to ignore these days. Please join me in sending thoughts and peace to the family of Ahmad Arbor. Let's not wait for death and murder to lead our lives with kindness and compassion. Practice kindness in all ways you can and as much as you can until you don't have to think about it, like breathing. Let's get oriented to how to discuss this issue. Anyone who knows me and has worked with me uh, knows I talk how, about how important language is. As a therapist, 
words matter. And so does body language, our facial expressions, the origin of the meanings behind our language, as well as how, we are, how they are received and interpreted. This is critical as we dive into the conversation. I like to say, let's approach this with childlike curiosity. It's about exploring, wondering, taking it all in as if our brains are just learning how to connect the dots for the first time. When a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. A quote by Alexander Den Heyer. I'm sure we all love quotes that we can personally relate to. But how many of us stop to wonder about the person who said it or wrote it? What's their story? What inspired them? Alexander is a speaker who helps people flourish by sharing insights and inspiration for personal transformation. He's inspired by a range of disciplines, including Uh, I'm sorry, including ancient wisdoms, the sciences, and philosophy. It's through this lens of bringing together ancient wisdoms, psychology, and neuroscience, and philosophy that I invite you to this discussion. <clears throat> what fascinates me about this quote is that it's relevant in thinking about therapy, adoption, and racism. Somewhere along the line, we've associated ther therapy with, we need to be fixed. For me, therapy is more of an exploration of life. And you've inv invited me along for a while, thinking I may be good company. And for the most part, I think I am. When it comes to adoption as an adoptee, I find myself having to manage quite a number of environments and have felt the need to fit in the best I could at the expense of who I really am. I've learned this is quite a universal experience when it comes to racism from the micro to the macro levels. No matter who we are, it begins with our own biases and prejudices. Truth is, we are both a witness to and an instrument in creating our environment. We are each other's neighbors. Therefore, we are each other's environments. In essence, we are fixing our environments at home, in our neighborhoods, communities, workplaces, industries, countries, the whole world. When we start with taking a good, hard look at ourselves. I, I came across this saying in my endeavor to learn the Korean language. Chon Lee Gildo Hangurum Buto means a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. Do you know who said this? Has this quote been meaningful to you? Okay, so now let's dig in. Let's take this first step. What is racism? Racism is different from racial prejudice hatred, or discrimination. Racism involves one group having the power to carry out systemic discrimination through the institutional policies and practices of the society and by shaping cultural beliefs and values that support those racist policies and practices. I got that from dismantlingracism.org. So here are a few examples. The number of COVID cases by race, the lack of access to healthcare by race, lack of diversity in educational curriculum, the exclusion of Asians in US history, the exclusion of international adoption in Asian American history. Psychologist Napoleon Wells puts it in the context of a spectrum with prejudice, which is something we all have on one side and racism on the other. 
he distinguishes racism as an act of malicious intent. And malice is defined as the intention or desire to do evil, ill will. This is what we are working to prevent. So who is racist? A racist is someone who communicates racist ideas or supports racist policies. It's literally black and white. Either you are actively acting on your racism or condoning it with your silence. And today, headline after headline, from microaggressions to murder, we've all been exposed to hundreds and perhaps thousands of reports of racism during this time. The question is, are we unintentionally supporting racism with our ignorance and silence? What keeps us complicit in allowing it to exist? Let's answer that with another question. What makes it racist? To answer that, let's put it, let's put this in Asian American historical context, starting with the yellow peril, which appeared in the 1800s and led to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Another historic marker were the Japanese internment camps during World War II. We have been witnessing history repeating itself despite our advances. There is another historical pattern that has been repeated for as long as we've been observing mental health awareness, almost 70 years. I'd like to say a word about the model minority myth. Frank Wu, a professor of Asian American studies at UC Hastings has said, quote, yes, we are applauding the Asians, but really what we're doing is denigrating other racial minorities. If Asians can do this, then there is no racial dis discrimination. Disparities don't count. Society has knowingly or unknowingly scapegoated Asian Americans. I feel it's so important to highlight the ongoing limitations of language as we enter a world of mixed races. With the increased interest in our ancestries, DNA testing, and investigations into our roots, racial identity is simply not clear cut. But this is a good thing. We are now paying that much more attention to the nuances that make each of us unique. It helps us realize that we all need to be seen and heard, that we all matter. We all impact our environments and the people in them. Here are some words and phrases that I'm hearing a lot these days. Solidarity. Speak up, self-care, fear, trauma, hate is a virus, Asian murder hornets, xenophobia, mental health crisis, suicide, stand together, talk to someone, journal, connect, quarantine, social distance. I could go on, but I'll stop and make an important note about the term social distancing. According to the APA Dictionary of Psych Psychology, Social distance refers to in interracial or interethnic relations between people. It can also be applied to other social categories, such as occupation, socioeconomic status, and education. Emery Bogardus created the social distance scale in the 1920s as an instrument used to measure individuals' attitudes towards particular ethnic groups. This doesn't sound like the way the term is being used today. Today, the US CDC uses social distancing and physical distancing interchangeably. Yet, I believe Emery Bogardus, this American sociologist from a century ago, would disagree with us. We are seeing and participating in another form of institutional racism. I now cringe and speak up as often as I can when I hear this term. And it's everywhere. It hurts me 
to my Asian American immigrant core. Now that I've pulled back this veil, I encourage everyone to continue to pull back these veils that keep us ignorant and blind to these insidious practices. We must educate ourselves so we can be more careful of our terminology and the language we use. So please pass the word along. We must remain socially connected while practicing physical distancing. So up to this point, we've identified the difference between prejudice and racism, gave a historical context. We've taken some deep breaths, explored the use of language and how we are each other's environments. All this comes to the conclusion that we must take a deep dive into ourselves, take responsibility for our prejudices and actions and appreciate the extraordinary value each of us has in shaping our world. Switching gears, let's now get into the action part of this. And I'll do my best to keep it simple in talking about adoption and racism. First, I'd like to acknowledge the adoptees who may be watching this and those who will watch this in the future. I understand we are all at different stages as we come out of the adoption fog. Please understand that I'm going through this as well. And then I know there are others who are further along than I am. And there are those who are just beginning. I offer my truth, where I am in my life, where I am today under the circumstances we're all living through right now. A gentle reminder to lead with compassion and kindness as we dig into our roots. So many people who have been transracially adopted have struggled with, struggled in connecting with their identities, their multiple losses, their sense of place and purpose, and like everyone else, relying on the narratives, assumptions, and visions for what makes a successful life. I appreciate all those who have spoken up, written, shared, and advocated to have our experiences known, heard, and validated. That's part of the sad truth. The fact there have been so many of us who have been speaking up for so many years. It's time we change that. It's time we stop history from repeating itself as it has for the last 70 years. I'm curious, with the advancements in mental health, why so many of us continue to have the same struggles. I do want to recognize that the adoption experience is on, is on its own spectrum. And I am happy for the ones who have had good, positive, and healthy adoption outcomes. Another quote from Zig Ziglar, who says, help bring your future into your present. And the present is the only time we can take action. So be present. And I don't mean in the trauma-based way of going from moment to moment without a thought to the consequences. I mean, be in reality, the here and now, Engaged in the world, conscious and awake. Acknowledge that the struggle is real. How do I reconcile with my Korean heritage, to which D.M. Borshe Lim's documentary, Geographies of Kinship, and those who shared their stories have continued to uncover about the sociopolitical role of international adoption? How do I address the inherent differences as a Korean American immigrant through adoption versus a native Korean immigrant who consciously made the choice to come to this country. It's complicated and it's hard, but there are additional layers to work through. First realizing that I am Korean. This is what needs to change. 
so many of us begin to come out of the fog as teens or young adults. And at that point, struggle with the basics of identity formation. This comes after, and many times simultaneously, with emerging pathologies. Amanda Baden at Montclair State University recently published her study on when to tell children that they are adopted. And the conclusion was, as early as possible, educate, inform, and build our knowledge as early as possible. For adoptive parents, this is your chance to act and act early to help us know ourselves and where we came from so we can spend the rest of our lives with the skills and tools to sort through. It may require you to address how you were raised, your cultural context, and take some perspective taking. What it also means for you is to see past the existing social narratives the headline news that props up transracial adoptions with black and brown children and their smiling faces. Understand that there is a powerful and very desperate industry struggling to sustain itself, not willing to face reality and make the changes it needs to. There are too many examples of it doing more of the same despite social advancements. So, Embrace us as we are. Know our stories, our native and cultural heritage, so you can teach them to us. The research has shown that early child experiences affects us, our development, relationships, and can follow us through adulthood. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So be present. Be in reality and not someone else's version of it. We're not blank slates. We have a deep inherent connection that gets pushed aside. It gets severed for many of us, and we need help re reattaching it, if possible. Too much time and too many lives are spent trying to undo the problems we create. This is universal. The sooner we reconnect with ourselves, the more we can enjoy the rewards of a long and healthy life. So seek safety, not self-destruction. You know, I'm speaking to my fellow young adult adoptees. Don't punish yourselves. You've done nothing wrong. And too often, you're simply dropped in the wrong garden. Survival is understandable, but will only get you through one scary moment to the next. Before I can offer any advice on joining groups, reading books, writing it out, seeking therapy, talking it through, all of which is simply about working towards finding the validation for your experience, ask yourself, am I ready for this? Make a checklist. Weigh the pros and cons. Make note if you have what you need to pursue that path. What's important is to stop reacting and start responding to life. For me, that's a key indicator you may be ready. Here's where we must jump ahead and think about where we hope future generations will be and our responsibility to create the environment for them to thrive in. I think it's safe to say that there's a good chance of seeing more people of mixed races in the future. And how many of us have been in, mixed race, uh, in a mixed race relationship? How many of us have chosen partners based on their race? Will today's narratives, social prejudices, and racist actions hold up in a world that may be more unified as a human race. There's so much to be curious about. With all the racism we're facing right now, where do we even begin? Well, I, I say it begins with our values. 
Personally, I advocate for all life. The health of this planet depends on our health. Prioritizing our health means we want to stay alive. We do want to stay alive, don't we? Address the prejudice in yourself. Are you supporting ideas like, I don't see color? Let's remember how it's about valuing our individuality and not allow our brains to drop us into categorical square holes. Asians are good at math. That's another one that's persistent. We must embrace who we are, which includes where we came from. Allow us to own our own voices, write our own narratives. The more we are able to, the more we become human and less of a statistic. The more likely we can have a sense of belonging, standing alongside our peers, neighbors, and racial communities. When you might be confronted by someone who's acting on their racism, assess for safety first, yours and theirs. Understand they are protecting, they are projecting onto you. So do your best not to take it personally. And you don't have to react and speak up in the moment. Fear and anger are strongly connected to fight and flight. As we've seen, a single act can be shared and help shape the environment in other ways. Planting seeds in others so they can question themselves and decide how they want to engage in the world. Safety first. You want to live, but not at the expense of harming someone else's life. Now is a good time to remind you to be conscious and awake. Peel back those veils. It's about knowing yourself, being connected with yourself, so you can make healthy decisions now and for the future. If you witness racism in any form, I suggest three things. Safety first. Ensure the situation isn't escalating. And if it is, reach out for help. Connect with the person the racism was directed at. Check in with them. Validate their experience. Let them know they aren't alone and are supported. Be present for them. It's about compassion and kindness. It's about being seen and heard. As an adoptive parent, and you hear your transracial child say they hate the way they look and wish they were like you, listen. Help them express themselves. Help them build the skills towards emotional regulation and emotional intelligence. I often bring up Kristen Neff in practicing self-compassion. I believe this leads to self-acceptance. Paradoxically, once we know ourselves, then we can change. Practice owning and shaping your inner voice as much as you can. And third, name the racism and educate others on how to identify, identify it. For example, microaggressions are as subtle as microexpressions. Fleeting facial expressions, sometimes you do them without realizing. They can also be micro insults, micro assaults, micro invalidations. Has anyone pointed out something you do that you didn't realize? Remember, Help your brain connect the dots. The goal is to calm your limbic system. The sudden rush of adrenaline and cortisol is meant to be temporary. This is what the concern is about, the impending mental health crisis. We must prior prioritize our health and our life. There's many things you can do on your own to maintain your mental health, including seeking professional help. 
And I'm so pleased we are embracing daily self-care routines to keep our mind, body, and spirit aligned. The more we can change our view of therapy, no longer seeing it as a place to get fixed, the more we're supporting the idea of being part of a healthy lifestyle, of it being part of a healthy lifestyle for ourselves. There are so many therapies available today that allows you to customize a mental health routine that best meets your needs. I do suggest to place as much importance on the connection with your therapist as with the therapeutic intervention. So <laughs> I've talked a lot, I've covered a lot here. Uh, understanding that racism has been an ongoing experience and that being transracially adopted adds more layers that must be challenged. Safety is the goal. Acknowledge the neuroscience and the neuroplasticity of learning. Addressing the traumatized brain as early as possible, which involves educating your child about, the, about themselves as they are, not who anyone else says they are. Challenge the existing narratives to make way for the ones we'll see in the future generations of mixed races. The importance of individuality and speaking your own truth so you can be seen, heard, and validated. Addressing your own prejudices. Addressing racism when it's directed at you or if you witness it. Safety and connecting with compassion and kindness knowing it all starts from within us. Mental health is not a simple intervention. It's an ongoing practice. It's part of your healthy lifestyle. And right now, I say it's about staying alive. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. So I'm looking forward to answering any questions, engaging you in the chat. I do appreciate you uh, sticking around, listening, and hopefully taking something away from what I've shared. So. Okay, we have one question. Um, Okay. Asking if you are opposed to international adoption. Okay, so I appreciate this question uh, because uh, I want to be clear about uh, separating out the idea of adoption. And certainly there are a number of children uh, who have been orphaned. Uh, who do deserve uh, a chance at growing up and having the life that they've meant to, you know, that they're meant to have. Uh, for me, part of my uh, advocacy for uh, adoption reform is more about the practices that have been in place for so long. Uh, right now, there's two that comes to mind. Uh, one is about the Adoptee Citizenship, Adoptee Citizenship Act. Uh, tens of thousands uh, of us, and not just in the last couple of years, but you know, this has been going on for a number of years. We're, we're found without uh, citizenship, and we're being deported back to our, our countries. Um, so I really appreciate the efforts uh, to get this act passed because that was something that I believe was built into the adoption practice, you know, the process of being adopted, and certainly something that uh, none of us adoptees had any say in or anything uh, to do with, you know. Um, so <clears throat> that's... Uh, one, the other one that um, uh, I advocate for is getting access to original birth certificates for those who are uh, 
domestically adopted. And I, I can certainly appreciate the historical context, but uh, uh, you know, it's not making much sense these days. And me, uh, I, I believe uh, I have a number of colleagues who feel, uh, you know, the laws that uh, were in place before are just simply obsolete, they're antiquated, and certainly have created a, a, a number of disconnections and loss, uh, created more loss, and uh, the, you know, not allowed us to have um, uh, the, you know, the information uh, that we need, as well as the possibility of relationship. So it's more about the practice and the, pre and, and the processes and procedures and policies that have been in place. Uh, but um, adoption itself, uh, no, you, you know, we're looking at uh, a number of children who are uh, without, uh, you know, any, uh, any families, any, uh, anyone, uh, you know, who's there for them. So, um, so yeah, uh, any other questions? Okay, this is a long one, um, so I'm going to just read it. So uh, the person thanks you for having this topic. Um, I'm a Korean adoptee, and it's not often that I hear about this topic. It's been so hard connecting with other adoptees that share this topic of racism and even want to acknowledge it at all, um, the difficulty of growing up transracially adopted. I'm 44 years old. I've been dealing with this for my whole life. I've been in therapy um, for years, but wish I knew others dealt with this decades ago. So I think that um, speaks to the need for support and for people speaking out as you are. Mm. Uh, well, thank you uh, uh, for being here uh, and for, for offering that comment. Uh, uh, I am so pleased that I am within a generation of writers, speakers, advocates, therapists, um, who, you know, are doing what we can to raise our voices, you know, and uh, change the way uh, things have been, you know, in the past, hopefully for the better. Moses, I know you got several mm -hmm. questions um, leading up. I don't know if there's any that were um, left over that didn't get covered in your talk that you'd like to sure. make any more comments about? Sure. Well, I'm, I'm happy to just run, run through them. Uh, uh, and, and I really, really hope that people will uh, be willing to email their questions to Tammy. Um, certainly put them in the chat. Uh, uh, this is really, uh, you know, our chance to turn this into a conversation rather than me you know, just offering, offering my thoughts on this. So, um, so when face to face with racism, should we stand our ground in the effort to educate the individual or perhaps work on educating the masses using those individual confrontations as examples in our lessons? Um, so I really appreciate this question. Uh, and I, I want to answer this uh, head on with um, every encounter is different. And this is why, you know, think about safety first and assess what might be going on, whether you could be in the grocery store, you could be out in the park, you could be, uh, you, you know, around your neighborhood, uh, right? Uh, you know, so, uh, begin with thinking, you know, what's going on within myself? Am I able to handle this kind of uh, encounter? Um, uh, what's happening in the other person? How are they coming at me? Uh, in what way? 
you know, if it's more just um, uh, something that they've said uh, as they're, you know, passing by us, uh, that might be something, uh, you know, to have a quick exchange. Um, but if it's, you know, certainly something that feels more aggressive, uh, you know, assess for your safety. Uh, but um, the way that I want to answer this really is, it starts with knowing yourself. Uh, you know, so uh, certainly um, keep it safe for yourself and the other person, and people around you. Um, so here's another one. Uh, please comment on kids of color raised in, quote, white world, uh, in the white world, and how they may adjust as they enter college or the workplace, workforce. Uh, so, um, so comment on, on kids of color raised in uh, a quote, uh, the white world. Um, so my comment is this, uh, there's a number of things you can do uh, uh, if, let's see, uh, yes, and how they may adjust. Okay, so we're, t we're looking at this, I wanted to be sure, we're looking at this from the point of view of, of the kid, um, not necessarily their, their parents uh, or adults around them. So from the kid's point of, point of view, depending on how old they are, of course, uh, uh, how they may adjust. Um, it's uh, leading with curiosity. Uh, it's asking, you know, oh, that seems kind of neat to look into. Um, uh, you know, kind of take a look at uh, uh, the kinds of people who are around you, the kind of neighborhood, the kind of community, um, the kind of school. Uh, and if you're curious about looking into uh, your, your race, your culture, um, it uh, really just kind of starts with, uh, uh, you know, what it is you're curious about and then pursue it. Uh, you know, if you want to surround yourself with more uh, people who you feel you can relate to, um, you know, nowadays it's, it's not just oh, what's available in, in your town or what's available uh, uh, you, where you can physically, physically get to, but thankfully with the internet, uh, there's all different kinds of ways to engage, learn, uh, and, um, you know, uh, Google is not uh, such a bad place to start. Um, Thank you, Moses. We also had a question in chat. Um, oh, okay. The same person wrote the question in kind of two different ways about adoption requirements and how much they've changed over the decades. She identifies that she was adopted in 1971 and is a survivor of child abuse from her adoptive parents and is asking about openness and adoption requirements for people to meet each other prior to adoption and if that's been helpful and if um, the requirements have changed uh, sufficiently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, uh, let's see, so... Uh, I want to make sure I have this just right. Right. Um, um, so the re requirements for ha for uh, reconnecting with uh, uh, birth families with birth parents, first fa first parents. Uh, I, I guess that's how I read it. Yeah. Um, yeah. To meet him. Mm -hmm. um, well. I believe, and certainly, you know, um, chime in here, Betsy, if, if you know this better than I, uh, I, I don't believe uh, that policy has changed uh, too much. Uh, I do know, you know, that there are more open adoptions these days than in the past. Uh, but in terms of parental rights, uh, and if this is, if we're talking about like uh, a domestic adoption uh, situation where 
uh, parental rights must be terminated, then I believe uh, the age is, is still 18 uh, for uh, being able to have any contact. Um, so, of course, uh, that's just what I'm, what I'm thinking off the top of my head. But, uh, does that sound right to you, Betsy? Uh, yeah, so the questioner is specifying that she's a Korean adoptee, and I don't know, I'm not a specialist in international adoption, so I don't know the standards, but um, if we're talking about people being required to meet each other, I don't think there's mandated openness. So the vast majority of adoptees are open, and even more international mm -hmm. adoptions have a lot more openness than they used to as the adoption is, mm -hmm. um, you know, being created, um, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's a requirement. So okay, thank you for the clarification. Now, now this is this is kind of a key thing uh, because it uh, this is where it's important to understand the kind of adoption, right? Because you know, being a Korean adoptee, well, you could be domestically adopted, you know, as a you know Korean adoptee, uh, you know. Um, so yes uh i would agree with you on, on that betsy you know internationally i don't think that there's a hard and fast re requirement uh but um uh these days uh you know people are searching and using the internet again uh dna testing uh there's now multiple ways to uh start the investigations start the searches uh, and make those connections happen. Uh, so um, I, I did also want to uh, pick out a, a detail. Uh, uh, tell me again uh, um, about uh, something about abuse. Uh, the adoptee question um, disclosed that she was adopted in 1971 and was abused by her adoptive parents. So I think her question centered around whether um, openness and adoption helps to keep that from happening as often, if I'm reading the question correctly. Okay, okay. Um, does openness and adoption uh, uh, mitigate or, or help with an abusive uh, adaptive situation? Am, am, I, am I capturing that right? Okay. Um, um, uh, I, I, I'm not entirely sure. I think, you know, having openness, having the ability to reach out to others uh, who may be uh, in a better place, who may be healthier, um, uh, who may not be abusive, uh, in abusive kind of situations, um, yes, I, I think uh, any chance to uh, widen your support network um, you know, is a good thing. Uh, your ability to find support, uh, find validation for your experience, uh, and certainly get whatever interventions you need. Uh, I think uh, certainly openness, you know, in that way is a good thing. Uh, and, uh, Moses, we also had a question about at what age did you see yourself as a Korean, as being Korean? Um, and what motivated you to learn more about your heritage? Uh, this is from a Korean adoptee who says that he um, doesn't see himself as being Korean. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I appreciate the question. Uh, um, and, you know, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say that uh, it, it, it happened for me as a, as a young adult. Uh, you know, um, it, it, it was uh, really the, the, the time in my life, uh, starting off my career and, uh, you know, getting into, uh, again, entering in, in different environments uh, that really kind of pressed on uh, how, I see it, how I saw myself. Um, and, um, you know, what's, in, what's interested me now, you know, what I find as a, a, um, a father, 
having kids is kind of a, a pivotal, pivotal time in your life uh, when you realize, oh, uh, there are younger people that I'm responsible for who are developing their sense of selves uh, and taking on that position of, well, in order for them to have a clear idea of who they are, uh, they, it, it's necessary to expose them to a range of things um, and certainly things that uh, they are inherently connected to, you know, which their heritage. So, um, so thank you for that question. Uh, um, I certainly wish you, wish, wish you luck uh, along your journey as well. Thank you. Any more questions, anyone, before we wrap up? We have a couple more minutes. Time, time for one or maybe two last questions. Um, yeah, well, here, I mean, there's a, there's a number of questions. Uh, and I think I just saw, saw another one. Betsy, we, we may need to have a, a second uh, presentation or uh, <laughs> maybe a whole series of uh, things just on this topic. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, so the, the question here is uh, the other people are agreeing to in chat. Um, so um, the question is, uh, what do you see as the best way to support their children, for parents to support their children as they navigate being a Korean adoptee? Mm. The best way. Uh, Oh boy. Well, I would say um, uh, um, immerse yourself, uh, and it, you know, in the Korean culture, uh, and really do your best. I would say start with uh, your child's uh, own uh, Korean identity. You know, do your best to uh, have a clear and coherent story. Uh, for for you know so you are able to pass that along um, so start uh, you know start very personally but otherwise immerse immerse yourself uh, you know feel free to uh, do your best to make friends um, uh, you know and learn about the history of Korea uh, uh, it, it, you know it's it, 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 it's a troubling history. Um, uh, so, um, so yes, uh, the best I could say is just simply immerse yourself as much as you can. Uh, really know the ins and outs. So when your child gets old enough and they start asking you questions, you'd actually be able to answer them. Um, so from a couple of the comments, um, People are uh, certainly encouraging us to continue the discussion. Um, I wonder if you also, we didn't talk about this ahead of time, but if you also have any um, websites or resources um, for people who are wanting to know more about specifically Korean adoptees. Uh, uh, okay. Um, oh boy. Uh, so what resources? Well, uh, I'd say, you know, there's uh, a number of uh, uh, groups uh, on Facebook. Um, I mean, really a whole lot of groups on Facebook. Uh, um, there's, uh, you know, other organizations uh, like uh, Khan and AKA. Um, gosh, uh, you, you really kind of put me on the spot here. So. Okay, so yeah, somebody in chat is recommending Khan too, which is K A A N. Mm -hmm. um, so people can Google and and use that. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last question, then we're going to wrap up. Um, uh, somebody would like to hear more about what you personally found helpful or what was not helpful in your identity development. Oh. Uh, what has been helpful? Um, uh, it was helpful uh, growing up in New York. It, it was helpful to 
grow up in, in a place that had already uh, a wide, diverse uh, number of people, and kinds of people, types of people, uh, you know, just just having more exposure to all different uh, uh, that wide range. Uh, so when I say really immerse yourself, I mean, you know, you may not want to move to New York uh, right now, but, uh, uh, you know, really uh, appreciate that we are part of a global community. You know, uh, if you're someone who likes to travel, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's really nice to um, be exposed uh, to so many different cultures, so many different countries, so many different places, so many different peoples. Uh, um, that was that definitely something that's been helpful for me. It, you know, has been my ability to travel. Uh, so, um, what what hasn't? Uh, boy, um, uh, uh, yes. Uh, I think we'd have to uh, move that into another another discussion. <laughs> Um. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time and your um, wisdom, uh, Moses. It's been very, um, very helpful to talk about this this evening. Um, so as we wrap up, um, as many people know, Adoption Network Cleveland is a nonprofit organization that serves individuals and families impacted by adoption, kinship care, foster care, um, through advocacy, education, and support. For more information, our website is adoptionnetwork.org. Um, we're very excited to be partnering with ex experts from our national adoption community in this Monday evening speaker series. Um, we are a membership organization and we hope that you will consider joining us as a member. Um, to find out more about that, you can go to our website. And um, please do uh, plan to join us next week when we host Leslie Pate McKinnon with her talk entitled, Welcome to the House of Mirrors, the importance of preparing for reunion. So again, thanks for joining us this evening. Yes, well, and thank you, and thank everyone for being here.